Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Book Club. Remember, no self-help, no weight loss, just stuff that rolls, explodes, and makes noise. We're here with author Mark Sonnery, who's done just an amazing book. It's called Maserati, The Citroen Years, 1968 to 1975. You know, those of us that love the Maseratis and the Citroens from those years have never really had a good reference. And this is the best one I've ever seen. In fact, truth be told, I did the forward to it. I was so impressed. He asked me if I would do the forward, and I read the book, and I was so impressed by it. It was an honor to do it because I have a Citroen SM. If you've been to the website, you may have seen our road test of it. If not, take a look. But this book explains how it all came together, how it all happened. It's a fascinating study. Tell us how you got involved with this. Well, when I was little, my dad worked for Citroen. When I was four years old, he worked in Lisbon, Portugal at the time. He brought these brochures. He said, we just bought this company. And I can still remember I was this tall looking at Indian Ghibli brochures. Fast forward to 75, he was working in Citroen, Germany. And one weekend, he comes with the Maserati Indy. I'm 11 years old. I said, can we go to the Autobahn? So I got hooked, you know. And uh, that's where it started. And more importantly, that era of Maserati has never been covered properly. As you know, there's far too few Maserati books, and that era usually got seven or eight pages. So I felt this was a worthy subject. And uh, it was amazing because I, I was able to interview a lot of people who'd never spoken before, clear a lot of mysteries, misunderstandings, and so forth. You know, Maserati is one of those companies, they were fantastic, built fantastic racing cars, but they never were successful. They, well, they were reasonably successful. It wasn't until they come out with the, what, maybe 3,500 that they made a road car. Yes, that was their first success as a road car. And Alfieri, Giulio Alfieri, head engineer, actually saved the company because they were yet again in financial trouble. And that was a complete turn because they gave up racing and they sold the 3,500. Right. That and was all, the start. Like a lot of companies, they lived pretty much hand to mouth. They never quite yes. had the prestige of Ferrari, although in my mind they did. But... Well, they had the prestige, not the financial resources, perhaps. No. Maserati probably would have gone under had Citroën not bought them, correct? That's right. They were in trouble. Uh, they were running out of funds. They were uh, using um, old machine tools. They were really uh, hitting the end of a path. And it's at that time, just like a miracle, that Citroën asked Maserati if they could do an alloy engine for their top-of-the-line car, right. which was supposed initially to be a modified DS, but right. then they realized they needed a whole new car. And in a few weeks, Maserati did an initial version for Citroën, who normally would take years at Citroën to do an engine, whereas Maserati, in weeks, they did one. And Citroën said, OK, we'll do this. And then from there, they decided, for the sake of stability, we'll buy the whole company. Right. Now, you dispel a lot of myths about these cars. Uh, this car, of course, has a Maserati V6 engine. And I remember at the time people dismissed it. Oh, it's just the V8 with two cylinders cut off. But that is not true, is it? No, this is, um, this is very interesting. What happened was um, that first they did cut a V8 strictly for internal study at Maserati because Maserati only did inline sixes up to that time. So they took an Indy engine, uh, ch chopped two cylinders off, and studied that internally. They took it to Paris to impress the French. Mm -hmm. And then they put that aside and started from a white sheet of paper. And you can see, obviously, that on the traditional Maserati V8, the chain is at the end of the block. Right. On the SM engine, the chain is in the middle of the block. So that was the misunderstanding. And in the book, I have a photo of that prototype V8-2, which is tucked away in a warehouse in right. Modena. Um, yeah, I enjoyed reading about the V8 SM. That was uh, fascinating. Right. And this was a decade, a uh, decades-long mystery, uh, literally 35 years. I had been looking for the answer, and it was the great... Paul Frère, the journalist, six sure. months before he passed away, that made me fall off my chair. Thankfully, it was not as high as this one. Yeah. Uh, when he said, by the way, did you know Julio Alfieri had an SM with a V8? Now, all the historians who know a lot more about the SM than I do never thought of asking a question south of the Alps in Italy about this SM V8. They all thought it was happening in France. So then it was like Columbus's egg. As soon as I knew it happened at the factory in Maserati, I asked the old timers who was involved, and I interviewed them. and. There came the story. That's the great thing. You know, a lot of people wonder why the Maserati has a V6 and not a V8. Because in France, anything over 2.7 liter exactly. was taxed just crazy. It was, it was like twice as much to have a 3 liter as it was yes. a 2.7 liter. So that's why later when they came to America, they, they beefed them up to 3 liters. Yes. But the 2.7 had plenty of power anyway. You know, books like this are really labors of love. You don't get rich writing these books. And that's what makes him so great, is that he puts his heart and soul into it. There were so many interviews with so many people that I 
sort of heard about, but they didn't really go into detail in a lot of magazine articles. And there are many great designers like Robert Opron, am I saying it correctly? Opron, yes. Opron, Opron? Yes. Okay, that's how you say it. I'm saying it the American way. He is one of the great designers, but right. I had just never heard much about him. For some reason, uh, the French don't translate a lot of their stuff or whatever, whatever reason. So They're very you, insular, yes. Yeah, you have that in here, too, and it's really fascinating. You know, the French have a whole different way of, do, of doing things. It's like on my Delage, you pull the sw light switches out to turn them off. I mean, just everything is opposite. Quirky. And, and, Quirky is, and you deal with a lot of those in here, which I find fascinating. The photography is amazing. Um, a lot of these look like never before seen factory shots. I had full access of, to the Maserati factory archives, and then at Citroën as well. And at Citroën in Paris, there were Maserati photos because they sent their own photographers in period. So there were fantastic shots that somehow had never been used before. Right. Likewise at Maserati, fantastic archive photos that they never actually used anywhere. Uh, great documents that you haven't seen before. Another aspect is that people may think if you're from Northern Europe or the US that French and Italian is the same. Well, they're very, very different. Right. And in some ways they got mixed perfectly. In some ways it was like oil and water. For example, you have a chapter about the Ligier Maseratis. Well, they would overheat at Le Mans. Right. So on the French side, they would say, oh, well, uh, those Italians, they can't make an engine that can stand the stress of the, the heat of Le Mans. Right. And uh, the Italians would say, well, those French, they cannot make radiators big enough. Right. <laughs> yeah. Ligier was not interested in PR. He ran his uh, JS2 uh, production. 82 cars were made uh, with the SM engine. Uh, there was a very close collaboration with Citroën. And then they made group four Ligiers, which were reasonably successful. And uh, then uh, he decided to go to F1. So that whole chapter was, was over. And uh, he was never interested in documenting history, so he wouldn't be interviewed. And then you deal with the Bora and the... Yes. So what happened was that uh, you were talking about the 3500 before. Maserati was running out to, of funds and they had obsolete cars. When Citroën arrived, the first statement was to make the Bora because the fashion was the Mura, which you know well. The fashion was the Mangusta. Uh, Ferrari hadn't yet done a rear midi for the road. Uh, the Bora was fantastic because it was far more advanced, far more evolved than all the other rear mid-engine cars at the time. Right. Very stable, very comfortable. Um, it was really uh, uh, extraordinary. And this is Citroën money that allowed that. And they use the uh, Citroën hydraulics as yes. well. Yes. Now here's this is a big matter that's been confirmed by every old timer at the factory that I interviewed. It was not Citroën who imposed that at all. Pierre Berco, the big boss of Citroën, said, I don't want anybody from Paris interfering with Maserati. Right. It was Giulio Alfieri, head engineer of Maserati, had been a Citroën fan, and he felt that these sports cars were getting ever faster, but the brakes were useless. And this was a matter of safety. Right. These Citroën brakes take some getting used to, but they're very powerful. They never fade, you know them well. And uh, also the hydraulics provided uh, in the cams in a hydraulically assisted clutch, uh, the, the DRV steering like in DSM, which means that a tiny person can face Los Angeles uh, rush hour traffic without a problem. Right. Whereas the poor man with the equivalent Ferrari after five minutes has no leg or arm muscles left. Well, it's fun to see, for example, all the original documents photographed for the book as well. I have some stationery with all this old sort of Maserati uh, letterhead on it. The relationship between the dealers, the importers, and the factory was not always uh, the smoothest. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, you know, when I was a kid growing up, these fell onto the label of foreign cars. And one guy would sell everything, Volkswagen, Maserati. I mean, they would just sell all the foreign cars. And that's probably why a lot of them got a bad reputation because, you know, right. they didn't supply parts or anything like that. You deal with everybody here, sales managers, uh, designers, anybody that had anything to do with these cars in yes. any way is, is in the book here. Nicely laid out. Where can they get this book? Uh, it's mostly for sale through the website, mm -hmm. which is orougepublishing.com. Uh, in the UK. Uh, it's delivered all over the world very quickly and safely. And how much uh, is the book? Uh, it's 90 pounds in the UK. Okay, so that's about $160, something like that? A little less. A little less than that, but you know something, it's a heck of a bargain. I'm surprised they can do the book that reasonably. I mean, just some amazing, this is obviously... This is an event we did in France last yeah. year. I do the registry for the CAMS, and it was a very forgotten yeah. model. And uh, I want to do a big anniversary for the 40th, and we got 27 CAMS in from all over Europe. Um, Norway, Austria, etc. We had Marcello Gandini, the famous designer, right. who normally is a recluse, who, yeah. who came. 
This was my X Camzen. Oh, okay. Um, and so, and tell people about this. This had which motor? Uh, 4.9 right. dry sump, 320 horsepower. Right. Very, very torquey, uh, very comfortable, very stable at high speed. This is as fast as a Ferrari Daytona in European spec. Right. And on most tracks, other than the fastest ones, it'll be just as fast with very good brakes, steering, very well balanced. You know, these are one of these great bargains that I think will skyrocket in price in years to come. Ferrari Daytonas, of course, are $400,000, $500,000, something like that. Whereas these, as you say, equally as fast at for what, a tenth of the price? Um, they were very cheap. Yeah. I bought mine actually in the US for $21,000 right. in 2004. And uh, now there's a dealer at the Essen Motor Show in Germany right now, Techno Classica, asking 150,000 euros for one. Right, right. So that's, that's extreme. But they went from $20,000 to $70,000 in a few years. And as you can see, beautiful engine drawings as well. It's, uh, it's really a complete, complete book. It's really just a fantastic... Uh, I can't imagine how much time and effort you must have put uh, in this. Far too much. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> no, no, but there's a certain degree of masochism in doing a book yes, like that. Yes, but it's, you but know, there was nothing on those cars. So it's a labor of love. There's a real period photo. Those look like a couple of uh, Italian guys back uh, in the day. Aldo and Alfredo. Yeah. Oh, is that who that is? If you have anyone in your family who is a car enthusiast for Citroen and Maserati, obviously, especially. This is uh, the best book on the market out there. It really is terrific. Mark, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, Jay. Came all the way from France to do this, so buy this book. <laughs>